The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, welcoming you back to our lecture series on the planets, covering the planet Mercury by Gustav Holst. We left off just a bar before this screen, where the strings were going back and forth in a series of three sets of two, counting out, sounding like one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now here, the pattern changes to 2-4. This does not mean that it is eighth note equals eighth note. It's more like quarter note equals dotted quarter note. So the beat is still consistent, the 6-8 beat being divided into the strong beats on 1 and 4, changing to 1 and 2 and 1 and 2 and... So the baton of the conductor can still keep hitting the down and up beat, but the rhythmic feel of the music will change. I'm actually really excited about this particular lecture because I feel that this is one of the most well-crafted and most cinematic moments in the entire suite of the planets. And it has to do with the ability to place the same thematic material, identical in fact, into different emotional and textural contexts and also dynamic contexts. So after a few bars of this little back and forth, and a little hint here of the first violins playing that high B, then a little bar of portato going into the solo violin line, which introduces that theme that I was talking about. <laughs> Dovetailing into oboe here, which continues on, then it's taken over by the first flute. Now, throughout all of this, the emotional context is just very light and sort of chirpy, very casual and free. This also, to me, seems very programmatic, but going back to Holst's more general emotional approach. So you could imagine this as the emotional state of the winged messenger just flitting around and doing his business and taking a lot of enjoyment in it. But it's nice to hear the contrasts on exactly the same notes, by the way. Solo violin to oboe to first flute. Let's have a listen to that. Listen for the effortless way that the same exact theme continues on through the three different instruments. And then I'll see you on the next screen. The trading off of the melody continues in Celesta. In this case, these notes are sounding an octave higher, even though they are written at the same pitch as the instruments on the previous page. Second harp, continuing the back and forth little bantering background. Now here is something interesting. The violins, just as before in our previous lesson, are really, really toning down things in order to accompany the celesta. We've got one desk of each group of instruments. And that is going to create a very intimate sound. It's almost like dropping down to a chamber music context. Celesta is a really beautiful instrument to use in chamber music. You may have seen me mention before this one chamber quartet by Villa Lobos, which is for flute, alto saxophone, harp, and celesta, with the special guests of a chorus of wordless women's voices. Actually, very similar to the way that this piece ends with Neptune. And the exquisiteness and delicacy of that piece is really amazing. I suggest that you check it out. It's called Quartetto Simbolico. I think that there are a few renditions of it on YouTube. My favorite recording is the one that was made, I think, back in the 1960s 
with Roger Wagner and his choral group and chamber musicians. Now, moving on, the Oboe family jumps in to take over the harp's role with this little back-and-forth bantering. And it really does sound very clucky and fun and carefree. It's the perfect background for the first A clarinet solo taking over. Now notice A clarinet, B flat, sounds G because the pitches are a minor third apart, correct? Taking over some of this harmonization are the bassoons. Something that you're going to notice from this point on is that the harmony is going to be radically changing along with the differences in textural accompaniment. And that is really part of the entire purpose of this huge section. And that is to see how many times this simple melody can be repeated in different contexts, and even leading up to an enormous joyous tutti, which we're going to get to in a page or two and still stay fresh and compelling and even compulsive to the listener, not losing any interest whatsoever, despite all of the repetitions. And that is a key feature of cinematic music today, especially when it's scored orchestrally. But let's get back to the orchestration. Notice how the bassoons start to rise, and as they do, the flutes join in to take the upper parts of the harmony. I want you to really listen to this part here, especially to see how well flutes and bassoons blend together. The relationship between the timbres of flutes and bassoons is something that fascinated orchestrators all the way back to the classical period, which I've also pointed out, I think, in my Mozart score reading lesson. And you can hear a little bit of that here, too. I really love the way that this written E-flat note comes in, and you can just really hear the top of this harmony in there, even with really good orchestras that try to control it. In the recording that I'm about to play, you'll hear maybe not the most professional first horn player trying to control that and not let it get to be too big. And it can have a tendency to shout over the top of the A clarinets, but all the same, it is still a very, very cool harmonization and and background to the second violins coming in. Mutes are coming off, and we are going back to 2 T seconds rather than a single desk. And so suddenly this string sound just leaps right out of the texture, even though it's marked piano crescendo along with everything else. Just suddenly you get that emphatic string sound that is so central to the symphonic idiom Let's have a listen to the music on this screen now, and keep all of those things in mind. The sound of the celesta being very delicately accompanied by one desk strings, so that would be the front two players of each group of strings. Jumping over to this very sprightly oboe and English horn accompaniment under the A clarinet solo, with, of course, bassoons and then bassoons plus flutes providing a bit of a background pad. The sound of this written E-flat, which is actually A-flat, coming in and doing this curve down into the next texture of horns plus clarinets, which is a very, very cool sound as well. Have a listen to that, and then I'll see you on the next screen. Here on the next page, you'll notice that Holst is just adding elements to the existing approach of the previous phrase. This time, all 30 or 35 or however many violins playing together, firsts and seconds, along with just a touch of viola tremolo in the background. We still got our clarinets, we've still got our horns, but this time we are adding the oboe family, and these pitches are essentially the same. Here's where it's a challenge to really read all of the different transpositions. Oboes 
and base oboe essentially in C, but of course the base oboe transposing up an octave from the sounding pitches, and English horn written a perfect fifth higher than the sounding pitches. But if you just translate all of these, they end up being the same. So for instance, concert G is the same thing as down a third from this B flat, sounding G, and down a fifth from this D, sounding G. You can work out all of this. But what we're just hearing here is the right hand of one of the pianists playing louder and louder and louder, being reinterpreted with more and more weight from the wind section. Here's a fun thing. The bassoons, A2, are doubling the line of the bass oboe, and that is also being played by the viola. So F, E, F, G, B, A. Same thing here, F, E, F, G, B, A. So that is actually a pretty strong bass, and you can see how the name of bass oboe really justifies it for its family. It is really being used as a bass note to the harmony here, along with the bassoons. Really, really effective, if very thick, doubling of having a two bassoons plus bass oboe on the same note. Of course, they are somewhat moderated from sounding too honky by adding the violas on the same pitches. Okay, moving on. One of the problems here with the way that the past two phrases have been accompanied is that they're somewhat static. The energy of each phrase is really taken directly from the growing passion of the players as they crescendo and play this really interesting motive. So we need to bring some of that energy back though, or else it's just going to be static all the way through. To solve that problem, Holst brings in pairs of eighths jumping back and forth and repeating. He's got beautifully arpeggiating harps. If you check out how the harps are arpeggiating, you'll see that they're pitched in harmonized arpeggios. So just kind of going through the standard, you know, fifth, sixth, sixth, fifth, sixth, sixth groupings as they go over the notes of, in this case, a B flat major chord. As to the rest of the accompaniment and melody, we now have octaves in our violins, doubled by flutes, both A clarinets and B flat clarinet on the same pitch here. They're doubling the seconds. So the first violins are really all on their own up there, but they're getting so much support from the overtones of the instruments below them that they feel equally strong. I wouldn't count on that all of the time, but it works really well here. The harmonic accompaniment is getting higher in both oboes and horns. Notice that instead of going through a series of chords here, the accompaniment is just sitting on a B-flat chord pretty heavily. Added to that, we've got bassoons and bass clarinet, then dropping down to G minor against the B-flat chord. I really love this four against six tuplet here. That's needed because of the change back to a six eight feel to the rhythm that's signaled here. There will be a tendency on the part of the orchestra to frantically push towards this fortissimo, but I feel that it's best if the players just suddenly leap up to fortissimo from forte rather than crescendoing in the last two or three bars, which I've heard quite often. I think it's best to just hit the audience in the face with this sudden leap up to high C in the strings and the piccolo and flute. Meanwhile, that same motive is going on with the clarinets and the oboes and with the first trumpet and second trumpet joining in. But notice what happens here. Holst scores a sort of a walk down amongst the instruments, going from the first violins and then dropping down to the violas and taken over by what were once melody instruments, right? And then 
the instruments of the walkdown take over the melody. And this goes back and forth for the rest of this screen. There really is no loss of energy by doing this, but there is a certain telescoping, once again, of function that means that there doesn't even need to be a diminuendo marked until here. The fact that the accompaniment and the melody are being scored by fewer instruments in lower places means that the intensity of the music is going to naturally subside. So we don't really need to mention it until here because there's going to be a bit of a drop-off going into the next phrase. But let's look at this big tutti. This is so cinematic and it's a very, very simple idea. If you just look at the piano score, you'll see there are descending octaves, there's the melody, there's some harmonic accompaniment, but there really isn't a whole lot going on in terms of different functions. It just sounds really huge because it's stretched out so skillfully across so many instruments. I love the way the violas are doubling the oboes and clarinets here. I feel that's a, just a very, very powerful type of unison and really gives enough character to that line of the strings, enough symphonic character, that it doesn't just become this sort of blatting wind and trumpet idea in the middle. Very, very effective doubling of the horns here on that sounding C third, written G third. And this is very, very cool. Just a touch of timpani right in there, rolling and then dying off right at the end. So let's have a listen to that page and just listen to how all of that builds. The adding of oboes to the clarinets and horns, the uh, tremolo and the violas, if you can hear it, the addition of the harps and how they add energy along with the middle strings, the way that the motive leaps up here to an octave, and then the way things leap up to fortissimo and even higher in terms of pitch with that descending line, the way the instruments trade off the motive as the music descends, and the way a natural diminuendo is built right into the way that things are scored in terms of descending pitch and telescoping instrumental functions, so that this phrase here is the first time that the diminuendo needs to really be marked. Have a listen to all that, and I will see you on the last screen for this lecture. Now, just because there was diminuendo marked in the previous phrase, it doesn't mean that this is not going to be intense. It is very intense. You've got octaves here, sol G in the violins, and then doubling of violas and cellos on this very, very fierce sound, especially when also doubled on the top line by the horns. It's just a very, very intense sound. Once again, incredibly cinematic. Uh, I would suggest that you study this. This is, in some sense, developed from similar passages by the late Romantics. I could uh, imagine Tchaikovsky, uh, Bruckner, some other passages there in some of the scores that came before. Then a very pungent sound from the lower winds, bass oboe, English horn. What I think is cool about this is how Holst takes this very, very thick, intense sound, changes the context slightly in the way that instruments double each other, and ends up with a very, very gentle sound right here. The way that he does that is to take bass oboe and first oboe. He has them replace somewhat the function of the horn in thickening the line here. He strips out the second violin so that just viola and first violins are doubling the oboe and bass oboe. But he maintains some of these lower winds continuing on 
adding to the harmony in the middle and doubling the cellos and double basses, adding a diminuendo once again, and then suddenly you are left alone with a two flutes supported by a little C octave and a third in bassoons that are being dovetailed to by the strings. I think that just is the most charming, fun, and yes, unashamedly cinematic, programmatic moment. It's a great way of wrapping up everything that happened before. And once again, throughout this whole section and this whole lecture, we have been analyzing the same thematic material repeated over and over again. Without all of this analysis, it probably feels like it's just very natural and builds and it's exciting and you barely even notice how it was put together. And I hope that this won't be a reason for you to look at it now and say, oh, hey, that's just repeating. And boy, that's boring. It isn't boring. What's exciting about it is precisely the trickery that Holst pulls on you, evoking the god of mischief. Holst has basically gotten to the end of composing his entire suite, as this was the last movement to be composed, and he's just going to have a little fun with you now, and I feel that that is what is happening here. I'm adding a few bars here at the end just to show you how the previous material tries to burst out of the static moment that we've arrived at lower winds holding on to a continuation of the harmony going forwards, going back to muted strings, kind of seamlessly dovetailing into that with the, uh, with once again, B flat clarinet and A clarinet trying to break out. And we will see how that all leads to certain recaps and certain developments of previous material in our third and final lecture on Mercury the Winged Messenger, coming up in about 10 days on Patreon and maybe a couple of weeks on YouTube. Meanwhile, have a listen to everything I just talked about, especially the lovely dramatic thickness of this passage right in here and how it gives over to a sort of a moderation of the same elements and ends up in a very quiet, contemplative place. And then how the original material tries to break out from the beginning. Pay attention to the difference in timbre between these two little bursts of motive. And after that, I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you.